Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're glad to have everybody here this morning. I think the weather's kept uh, most people away, and so hope they're watching uh, via the internet. If you're watching us via the internet this morning, we're very, very glad that you uh, have joined us. Uh, it's kind of a kind of a rainy day here on the mountain, and uh, real uh, real wet weather over the last couple of days, and real windy here this morning too. So. Uh, but we're thankful that uh, that you made the effort to come out and uh, uh, be with us this morning. For those of you who couldn't make it uh, today, we uh, we hope you're watching or that you'll you'll go to the archived uh, section on YouTube and, and join us. So uh, we got plenty of uh, got plenty of room here this morning. My name is Teddy Baker, along with. Uh, my wife Jan and Jim and Sandra Penner, this is our, our weekly ministry to you guys and we're, uh, we're just honored to be able to do it on a weekly basis. Uh, we're going to do, do a couple of great Christmas hymns uh, this morning. Turn this down this morning.
salvation brings that loving heart in This morning, uh, pray for Jim and Sandra. They're on their way back from uh, Dothan, Alabama. She went down to uh, visit a little while with her mom, and uh, and also uh, pray for their pastor down there, Raymond Holt. He's 95 years old and uh, still preaching. And uh, but uh, here recently he developed pneumonia and uh, became uh, really sick. And uh, and I, I think at one point he became. Uh, uh, kind of uh, confused and, and that thing and they found out he had a, a couple of blood clots in, in, his, in his brain and so they literally had to go in uh, to his brain to drain those and so now he's he's on uh, a feeding tube and uh, and they're saying that you know if he does recover from this that the, the recovery process is going to be a, a long process and so we certainly want to pray for Brother Holt as uh, Sandra and Jim call it and, uh, and keep him in our prayers. Uh, also, uh, got a praise we want to give for Dawnie. She's Wonder Woman. She, she had Tuesday on, on, on Tuesday. She had surgery and uh, at worship this morning. And I think she's going to hike uh, Yona Mountain later on this afternoon. By herself. By herself. <laughs> Amen. I get an asthma attack going to the mailbox. <laughs> morning and we uh, also want to pray uh, continue to pray uh, for for Denise uh, Sue Hiding's sister uh, any any updates or just kind of the same process of just kind of hanging in there and dealing with this cancer and uh, man, I told Jan I, I just pray one day that they will, will truly find a cure for this and uh, we can get on with something else but th this has been and unbelievable. Uh, continue to pray for Karen O'Neill and, uh, and her mom Jean as, as she's recovering as well and Karen and, uh, and Becky also, Becky and Bill, Becky's uh, still down in Florida with, uh, with her stepmom Barb and we want to continue to pray that they, uh, they recover. And uh, uh, I haven't heard this week from uh, Cheryl Oriosky but uh, her friend Marilyn Hirsch uh, who's been uh, dealing with cancer as well. So um, I think that's everybody. So, uh, oh, no.
Kathy Coleman uh, yes. is, is, is going to have to have uh, some heart surgery. And they had her scheduled for Christmas Eve. <laughs> and, uh, but the doctor has since uh, had a couple of emergencies come up. And so she's been moved to uh, the morning of the 26th. Uh, and so she's going to have open heart surgery. And uh, so please keep uh, Kathy and uh, Kathy Coleman and Kathy and Jerry. Uh, I got a message from them this morning. They were planning on be here, but uh, she said Jerry's trying to get sick, and so I want to want to pray for Jerry as well. Yes, they're going to be in uh, Gainesville. Yeah, Tommy that list. Who? Tommy that list. Tommy McCore. Yeah, Tommy McCore. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have a friend, Danny Jones, who's just started chemo and third stage uh, colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and don't forget Sherry. Yes. Figure out yeah, Sherry, uh, Sherry Connor. She's been having some some of the same issues that I was dealing with for a long time, and so uh, we'll we'll definitely pray for them. Anybody else? Is that it? We got a small crowd here this morning, so we can pray for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 People traveling, yeah, traveling mercies uh, for this time of year, absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we do lift up all, all of our prayer requests to you this morning, and just praying, believing God that you are are hearing our prayers, that they go further than just the ceiling, that you actually hear them and and respond to our, our prayers for those who, who need healing, God. We just pray your healing touch on them. For, for those that need comfort and, and just a sense of peace, I pray that you would fill them with uh, uh, comfort and, and the peace that passes all understanding. And we pray for those who are traveling today, God, especially Jim and Sandra who are traveling in this weather. We just pray your blessings over them, that you would bring them home safely. We pray for the message this morning, God, as we continue in our Advent series. I pray, Father, that you would uh, allow your word to speak true and to uh, speak through to our hearts and that we would uh, not only hear the word, but we would be doers of the word. We love you, Lord. We thank you for every single day that you give us. We praise you, Father, and ask your blessings in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said... Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be in the in the book of Luke, and uh, we're going to be looking in uh, Luke chapter two, just a, a couple of verses. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter two. As I, I was preparing for this week's message, as I was studying about what what the Lord might have me to say, I, I came upon this this conclusion. And I, I want to share it with you this morning. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Ready. Here it is. It's a real revelation. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> as humans, as humans, we are complex creatures. Are we? You're going, duh. <laughs> but we really are. We're, we're complex creatures. Creatures. It's like a like a story I read this week. It says a school teacher lost her life savings in a business scheme that had been elaborately explained by this swindler. And when her investment disappeared and her dream was shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. And so the official asked her, well, "Why on earth didn't you come to us first? Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? And she said, oh, oh yeah, yeah, sadly, I, I, absolutely, I, I know about the Better Business Bureau. I, I've always known about you. But I didn't come because I was afraid that you would tell me not to do it. <laughs> you see, the folly of human nature is that even though we know where the answers lie, we ignore the truth of the situation for fear 
of what it will say, especially when it comes to God's Word. We really are complex creatures. We, we have goals and aspirations that are, are noble and strong, and, and yet we get tripped up by our own weaknesses along the way to fulfilling our goals. So very often, we, we tend to hurt those we love, our, our families, our, our friends. We, we love God, and yet we sin against God. We, we can never seem to outrun the allure of the pleasures of, of sin, e even for a season. Even those who are not accustomed to giving in to temptation know that if they're honest, how much of an uphill battle it is to, to try to keep their noses clean, to, to walk a straight line, to, to stay on balance, to keep from falling. Those who stop being honest about their frailties in this regard become those that are holier than thou. Which is, of course, it's a worse sin than most. And, and yet, today in our, our fourth Sunday of Advent, we are encouraged to consider a big and bold and challenging and encouraging idea that's wrapped up in a three-letter word. J-O-Y. Joy. Joy is such a big part of the festivities of the season for, for so many. Jan and I were out shopping the other day and I, I was amazed at how many people I saw that were wearing Santa hats and smiling and they were humming or singing Christmas carols and it, it was really, I mean, it was quite refreshing to see that. I mean, too, too bad it doesn't go on that way throughout the whole year. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And, and there are great and wonderful reasons that we are told. Re reasons that are both historical and current in our lives for being jubilant and celebrating good things and expressing this loaded word, joy. Especially during this time of year. But you know, it's, it's hard to string those letters together when you're the one dealing with the reality of how very hard life is and how very real and present your pain is. Part of a poem that I, I read this week says, the joy is an illusion to which there is no end. And it's just life that has too many bends. You never know which way you turn. But the grass that appears greener on the other side never turns to be true. That sentiment is a, is a reality for far too many during this time of year. Very often, many of you come to worship bearing the, the hardships, e even the wounds of your past week. There are times for all of us when, when life appears to get or, or at least it feels like it's, it's getting the best of us. And yet, here we are together. Here we are right back again at this word, J-O-Y. It's the theme of our Advent celebration today and it's a Christmas word. And no matter how we feel or, or what we think when we see that word, it, it, it is a word to be reckoned with. So I want us to look together at our scripture found in Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And it says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
today, wherever you are, whether you're here watching over the internet, riding in a car somewhere, it doesn't matter. Today, I want us to really consider joy. What does this season call us to? What, what does God say to us in this season of light? Especially when we may be so aware of the darkness around us and even inside of us. What can we do to experience real joy this Christmas? I want us to look at four aspects of, of great joy that I want to offer you this morning. The first aspect of great joy is this. Great joy breaks through to our reality. And the angel said to them, fear not. You may remember that in this scenario, the angel was speaking to the shepherds. And here they were minding their own business, minding their sheep, feeding them, getting them ready to bed down for the night. And it's just a, another typical evening outside the walls of the city. Because that's where they were made to stay. And all of a sudden, this, the angel breaks through space and time. And all of a sudden, this angel is in the midst of their reality and says to them, don't be afraid. Fear not. I've got a message of great joy for you. And not only for you, but for all the people. A Savior who is Christ the Lord is born to you on this day in the city of David. It was a, a specific time. It was a specific place. Well, guess what? I believe that that's still happening today. I believe that great joy breaks through to our reality. And notice what I didn't say. I didn't say breaks in on our reality. Because the Holy Spirit is not like someone who breaks in on us. He's not a burglar. He's, he doesn't want us to feel violated or to take something from us. He wants to break through to our reality. And He wants to meet each one of us right where we are. He wants to help, to heal, to set us free from the sin that so easily trips us up, the Bible says. He, he points the way to Christ. He, he encourages us. He guides us back into Christ consciousness so, so that we can experience great joy as we live each day in His presence. The question is, do we really get that? Do we really expect God to break through to our reality? <coughs> My opinion is, I think that often we don't expect God to do that. I also think that that's part of the human condition that we struggle with the most. You see, we make the choice to maintain control of our lives instead of yielding to God's Word and His working in our lives. In his book, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer describes two veils. The first veil was the veil between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the world. And th that veil was torn at the death of Jesus. And it, it signified the availability of, of God's manifest presence to all. The second veil is the veil of our own hearts. It's, it's that veil is torn only through our decision to tear it ourselves by God's grace. Maybe our questions should be, what would he look like if we could dare to look at him? What, what would He do if He was to break into my reality and to my pain? 
the truth is that the Christian life isn't so much about our ability to abide in God perfectly more than it is about God's grace to draw near to us in our response to allowing the Holy Spirit to break through to our reality. You see, God has no ex expectation that we would live this life perfectly. Psalm 103.14 says, He remembers our frame and He knows that we are but dust. But what He desires from us is to allow the Holy Spirit to break through to our reality and illuminate any parts of our lives that aren't His so that we can once again experience great joy, the great joy of His presence. Does that make sense? You see, God is not angry at us for veiling our hearts. He, he knows better than we do the reasons that we aren't letting Him fully break through to our reality. His heart is filled with the fullness of compassion for you and for me that we might live to experience His grace. One way of interpreting our scripture is that on that night in history, the Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, broke through to human reality. The everlasting one personally breaks through to the human situation. The creator of heaven and earth was born, wrapped in human flesh, no more feeling like he's at arm's length, no more human theories about what God is, is like, or who is God, no more missing the point of what God is saying. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That means that divinity, divinity has beaten a path into the human dilemma. Looking humanity straight in the eyes and called us brother, sister, friend. Great joy breaks through to our reality. The second aspect of it is that great joy is also transcendent. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Not just some. Not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. For all. And so what I get out of it, there's something in this message of, of, of this season that is universal. It's truly for everyone. Jew, Gentile, Muslim, Hindu, you name it. All the religions of the world, all the people groups of the world, this message is universal. It's for everyone. And this story is not, not like the stories that we find in the evening news. There, there, there is something about this story, this message, that informs us about great joy for all people. Have you ever noticed that there, there's not a lot in life that's really suited for everyone equally? Would you agree with that? I mean, many companies make claims about their products and, and their services that that they offer being for everyone. But the real truth is found in their disclaimers. You ever, especially the guy at the end of the TV commercial. You know that guy? Yeah. You know, he, he talks really, really, really fast. He's kind of like an auctioneer. And, and so what he's trying to do is kind of, kind of slide that disclaimer by us really fast to, to let us know that this may not be for everybody. <laughs> Do 
The fact is, not everything is for everyone. We're used to understanding that, that life doesn't treat everyone equally. Not everyone is wealthy or healthy. Not everyone has the, the same access even to the necessities of life. As much as we look at the things like poverty in our communities and on our streets, we recognize that compared to a lot of other nations in the world, America is a filthy rich nation. And even in the simplicity that, that most of us live in, we live like kings and queens compared to other people for whom eight people sharing a, a, a bedroom is the norm. Eating one meal a day is at most the norm. Something as extravagant as entertainment as we know it does not exist. There is a great deal of inequity in the world. But there's something about this news of great joy that the angels bring to us that is for all people. In this news, we share something in common. In this news, we are united across dividing lines. The Bible tells us that there is something very good in this news. You ever notice that good news usually doesn't sell real well? I mean, every once in a while someone will start a, a newspaper article with something, some kind of good news. Or every once in a while some TV news broadcast will end their show with a story that has a happy ending. But what happens to those Ventures. What happens to all of that? The reality is that they die out. And it's not, it's not the lack of good news, but it's due to enough people being interested enough to watch good news when they're so influenced by the bad news that's being broadcast on a daily basis. We got, oh, yeah, 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 but that guy, you know, I want to get back to this guy. Or that guy. Or what they did. Or what they did. Yeah, that's a great. I'm glad they had a happy day. But this, this is good news. Something that we should want to hear. Something that we should want to know about. Maybe even want to spread to, to our neighbors, someone else, that we can influence in a positive way. And it's news of great joy, the Bible tells us. This news is, is worthy of our attention. It's, it's worth stopping to hear. It's good. It's about something that will bring great joy. And it's for you. And it's for me. And it's for the person sitting next to you, wherever you are. What is the nature of this news of great joy? At the very least, it is transcendent. That means it goes beyond ordinary limits. It surpasses everything that we might expect. It exceeds our imagination. If everyone in any circumstance of life can access this joy, it must be a joy that rises above our circumstance. It must be a joy that is not the property of one class or just one nation or just one people. It is the joy <laughs> of Christ available to all who will accept this great joy. The third aspect of this great joy is that this great joy makes me look up. 
If this is a joy for everyone, then it is a generous joy. Amen? Amen. If it is a generous joy about the great news of Christ's coming, then it would seem likely to cause me to shift my focus from only my needs to the needs of someone else. Perhaps you. Perhaps I need to shift my needs to you, to someone else. Perhaps this is a joy that takes me out of my personal sorrow, my personal pain, the things that I deal with on a daily basis, and helps me to look beyond my own struggles. Dr. Carl Menninger, a world-famous psychiatrist, was answering questions after giving a lecture on mental health when one person asked, what would you advise someone to do if he felt he or she felt a nervous breakdown coming on? Most people expected the doctor to say, consult a psychiatrist. Instead, this is what he said. Lock up your house. Go across the railroad tracks. Find someone in need and do something to help that person. You see, this psychiatrist knows that those who serve others have less mental and psychological problems. The best way to bring on a heart attack or a mental or emotional breakdown statistically is to think about yourself all the time. What about me? It's all about me. <clears throat> what am I going to get out of? Best way to bring on a heart attack or a mental or emotional breakdown is to think too much about us individually. You see, this great joy that we've been given, this news of the incarnation, God taking on human flesh lifts me up above my situation and calls me to participate in something much greater than just my singular life, just as one person. Somehow this news connects me and it connects it connects me to you. It connects you to me. And I'm just using myself as, as an example. Jan and I are not having problems. So. <laughs> She's going to go, well, what did you say that for? Everybody's going to think we're having problems. No. It's just I am the individual. You are the individual. We all are individuals. And what this great news us is, is that it... it it calls to both of us, to all of us, to lift our eyes up, to look beyond the valleys, even the, the hills, to the one who created both from his dwelling place. And who is this good news suggest is not planning on sitting tight in his dwelling place. He came to be one of us. To be with us. He's coming. He's coming to you and He's coming to me. One of my favorite chapters in Psalms is Psalm 129. I mean 121 because it reminds us I look up to the mountains. Does my strength come from the mountains? No. My strength comes from God who made heaven and earth and the mountains. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep. Not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian 
right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke, sheltering you from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. The fourth aspect of great joy is this. Great joy calls us to commitment. You see, if you come to worship much, you have a good idea by now of what faith is all about. I mean, you know who Jesus is and you, you know that he, that he came to us as a baby, but not to just stay as a baby, but to grow up, to be the man, Jesus. The fully human, fully human, fully God person who would reveal to us the thoughts of God and the heart of God. All the fullness of God would be revealed in Jesus as He would walk the streets of Jerusalem, as He would talk with the people and walk with the people and heal the people. Yet He would be tried before Pilate. And He would be unjustly condemned. You see, the Christ child grows up to be the one who suffers for our sakes on the cross. Motivated and spurred on and incarnating the mighty love of God. Jesus will die on the cross. And in doing so, He'll defeat death and He will triumph over the grave and all our hope and, and our purpose and our, our love for, are somehow bound up in His whole magnificent life. Born in abject poverty in a vile, stinking stable. Humble, weak, yet so incredibly powerful and world-changing in His passionate love for Humanity, for humankind, for you, for me. The joy of this season is an invitation to something that transcends our, our pain, our struggles. This joy, His joy, points us to something that, that makes us look beyond ourselves to the needs of others. But it, all, it also is a calling to commit or to recommit our lives to the truths of this season. That's not a popular thing to say these days. But a call to truth is a call to making a decision that other people don't necessarily want you to make. What truths does a season of joy call us to? It's really pretty simple. It's the truth that the gospel is real. That the incarnation of Christ, God manifested Himself in the second person of the Trinity and He came to us in the flesh. It's the truth that it's not fiction. It's, it's rather the most important truth there is. And this truth calls us to commit our whole life to Christ, to this Christ child that we celebrate this season. You see, it, it's more than just a call to believe. It's a call to expect God. That's what this Advent season is about. It's preparing. It's being expectant for the coming of the Christ child. And so it's to expect that God does reach. That He has reached into human history. And that means, by the way, 
that He reaches into your story, into my story. He reaches into your life journey and my life journey that each one of us is now on. And He reaches into our lives in order to shape us and to mold us, in order to make us like His own beloved Son. That we become made and molded more into the image of Christ. And it starts by the Holy Spirit of God birthing something in each one of us. Just as it was birthed in Mary. That's where the joy comes from. And, and that's where the Advent Sunday of joy and, and, and the reality of the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians talks about. That, that fruit of the Spirit, joy. It's where the Advent Sunday of joy and the reality of the fruit of the Spirit, joy, converge and come together. Let me conclude with this. God's, God's joy, this great joy, is birthed anew in us as He sends the Holy Spirit to do two things in our life. The first thing the Holy Spirit does is that He brings faith. And it's not just the faith that I hope the Falcons show up to play football. <laughs> <laughs> or I hope, you know, I'm going to get the job or I hope this. It's not that. It, it, it is a saving faith. <clears throat> You see, if we've never known the Son, if we've never known Jesus and Lord and Savior, if we've never received Him, even if you're watching over the internet, the Holy Spirit comes and bursts faith in us. He gives us the capacity to understand the Gospel. Have you ever wondered why some people understand the Gospel and others just don't see the point? Over the years, I've talked to so many people who will say, well, you know what, I've heard the gospel and it just, just kind of hits me cold. I, it, it just doesn't mean a thing to me. And I know what they are saying because I was the same way. I couldn't wrap my head around Jesus. This baby is you know, born at Christmas and he grows up and he does his healing and teaching and then he goes and dies on a cross. And, uh, I just wouldn't do that. <laughs> And so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get it. So I understand what they're saying. But when the Holy Spirit comes and, and He is welcomed, He takes up residence in each one of us. And He calls us to Jesus. And this is an incredible gift. And so when your heart is stirred, what I always say, receive the gift. That's the first thing. The Holy Spirit brings faith and it's a, a saving faith. The second thing the Holy Spirit does is that He renews our faith. You know, we, we may have been polarized by this past week. We may have had a lot of stuff goes on that really challenges our faith and challenges our belief. Hopes and dreams have been bloodied and we've lost track of why and any of it matters. And, and the Holy Spirit calls us to reclaim what we say we believe and what we believe in. To return if we need to. To, to place, to this, this place of surrender to God's will. To allow Him to bind up our wounds. To allow Him to take up the broken pieces of our lives and make us whole. And here's the cool thing. He really wants to do that. He, he wants to set us free. He, he cares when we get hurt. He, he cares when life smacks us around. He cares when we stumble and we fall. And, and He does way more than just care. He calls us to lift our eyes from the muck and, and the mire around us to look upon Him even as He comes to us as an infant. 
What an absolutely amazing thing to be called upon, to gaze upon the wonder of the baby in the, in the manger. And to try to grasp once again what deep and profound love exists in that feeding trough. That the Christ of God would leave His comfort at the right hand of the Father in order to come to me, in order to come to you in this manger. Think of the energy. Think, think of the effort. Think of the love bound up in this act of incarnation. There is joy, great joy in such thoughts. There is great joy in such understanding. And I would hope that, and I pray that, that the joy that calls out to us this season would fall upon ears that can hear. I would hope and pray that this deep divine joy that beckons our souls does indeed break out in us, becomes contagious and infectious to the people around us, that they can see Jesus in us during this Advent season, during the whole year. And that our Redeemer, the one whose arrival we anticipate afresh this Advent, knows and loves and reaches out to you and to me in order to say three words. Come. Follow me. My, boy, my hope, my prayer is that we would do just that. We'd follow Him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, how powerful Your Word is. It truly is a, a two-edged sword that cuts straight to the, the bone and the marrow. It reveals your truths and the power of your word and the access to the, the power and authority in our lives, God, that, that draws us to a, a higher calling, to a higher love, to a higher place of living and being more than just walking this sod every day with no purpose, no priority, other than just to meet our needs. Renew us, Lord. Draw us to Yourself. Your Word says if we draw near to You, that You will draw near to us. During this season and every day of this year, God, 2020 is right around the corner and we have this other, another opportunity to impact the world around us on Your behalf. Help us to do that, Lord. To be filled with great joy. Because you're alive in us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Everybody. Once again, uh, the service this Tuesday is going to be at 6.30. So spread the word. If you got other people that are not here today, if they didn't hear it last week, 6.30 to around 7.30 or so. 6.30 to 7.30, Tuesday evening, Christmas Eve. Be there, be square. Yeah. All right. <laughs>